Hello and welcome to another episode of Socratic Dialogues. And I am once again with Professor Fred Bauman. How are you? I'm doing okay. Thank you. How are you? Good. You're with uh, Kenyon College, political science mm-hmm. professor. And we're, today we're just going to have a little discussion about illiberalism on both sides and what maybe can be done academically or philosophically about this problem. Well, would it be useful, Michaela, do you think, to start the discussion by talking, before we talk about illiberalism, talking about what liberalism is and what it's for and why illiberalism is very often um, a danger to it and maybe even a, an appropriate alternative to it. At least that's what the illiberals claim. Would that, would that be all right or is that going too far off topic? That's fine. That's great. Okay. Um, see, liberalism we think of in terms of rights and individualism and da-da-da-da. Um, what it really is, I mean, it is all those things, but what it really is is a way of keeping the boat floating despite political disagreements. The fundamental political problem is that the individ- we are social beings, but we're not social in the way bees and ants are. We're only somewhat social. And so there's always a conflict between the individual and the community, and that has to be regulated. Now, the simple way of regulating it is by whoever has power giving orders and telling people to belt up and do what they're told until such time as that figure or those people lose power and then they're succeeded by other tyrannical people. Liberalism or republicanism, which isn't the, they're not the same thing, but they both point in the direction of figuring out a way to moderate that conflict between individual and community so that you don't need tyranny, so that you don't need despotism. It's a way of doing it so that everybody, the conflict is still there, but it's moderated. Everybody still feels they're stakeholders. The purpose of rights is to say, don't worry, even if you lose an election, they can't do anything they want to you. Uh, there are political rules so that uh, after the election uh, is is held, everybody agrees who won, who lost, and you go on as before. It's a procedural way of reassuring people that they can live together without being terrified of each other. It's inherently a really fragile way of operating, and it it goes it goes back before liberalism. This sort of notion goes back to the polis, to Aristotle, who talks about reciprocal justice. He says, without it is reciprocal justice that saves cities. Without it, people don't feel they're free. And what he means by that, and liberalism is an example of it, is the law is the same for everybody, and everybody's a stakeholder and has some kind of claim, even if the election goes against them. Um, that's inherently fragile, and especially in times of great social change or technological change. And late modernity, or whatever you want to call it, is nothing but rapid, rapid, rapid change. And so it makes, it creates people who feel that the rules are stacked against them. And it also creates people on, on top who survey the scene below them and say, oh, we could make this world wonderful. We could make it just great. Just give us the power to do it. And that leads to a kind of contempt for those fuddy-duddy due process rules that we don't need anymore or else they're really just a con and a sham and a way of covering up uh, power relations, and they're really tyrannical, and there's no reason why we shouldn't assume power, because, boy, will we be good when we get in. Um, That's the situation I think we're in now, uh, more and more, and not because we've had the Great Depression or lost World War I or something like that, Um, But I think largely because for several generations, nobody's taught 
Americans, especially the elite, uh, what the purpose of liberalism is. And so it's very easy to go back to the classic critiques of liberalism, Marxism. Yeah, it's all a sham, and it's really about property, and it's really about control, and we need to uh, have a proletarian revolution, and then we'll, we'll all be happy together. Or progressivism, which says... Oh, we've got science now. We we can, you know, Elizabeth Warren uh, goes back to Woodrow Wilson and Herbert Crowley. Uh, I got a plan for that. We know what to do. We experts know what to do. All these rules, these uh, old-fashioned constitutional 18th century rules just get in the way. And then there's postmodernism, which says, well, it's all power. It's all power. It goes back a little bit to Marx. It goes back to Nietzsche as well. It's all power. And, again, um, the checks and balances that liberalism establishes are illusions, and we can scorn them uh, as uh, stuff for the saps to believe. So in that climate, every issue starts looking like, in a much simpler way, Let's get past those rules and fix things. Um, and the example you list, race, is where you know, it's the great curse of American life, the, the treatment of blacks over, over the centuries. And it's still with us. I, when we passed the Civil Rights Act, I thought, okay, we're going to be all right. No, 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 we're not. Uh, affirmative action was supposed to fix it. It did not. And uh, we're with it with a vengeance again. And again, people are saying, uh, don't just stand there, do something. And we don't care about the rules, the old rules, because either they just got in the way or else they were sinister tricks to, to fool us into being quiescent. Yeah, uh, Malcolm X, any means necessary. Well, any means necessary. The essay is called The Bullet or the Ballot. I'm going to teach it on Tuesday. And the alternative to the ballot is the bullet. Um, so it's very tempting. Liberalism requires an awful lot of self-discipline, an awful lot of self-control. Um, and above all, it requires a real understanding of why it's necessary, why it's a way of avoiding civil war and despotism. And... It's very easy to revert back to the simple view, which is, you know, I got a hammer, here's a nail, I'm going to pound it in. Uh, you don't think ecologically, you don't think structurally, you think of fixing it. And that's what we're looking at now. Right, and it's important also to point out that liberalism is this kind of bubble that occurs in humanity very rarely. Uh, it's like almost like uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you look at the course of human history, yeah. it, it's only yeah. appeared in, in a little bit in Greece and maybe in other parts of Europe, uh, but then it flourished after the Enlightenment. And it's a, it, it's under assault at this point because of, like you're saying, yeah. forces that want things to be fixed. And yeah. but 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 this is also what... The problem is here is that when you have such a polarized society and one that just wants to say no to the other side always, like without any real thinking, what, where do things get fixed if, if it's not to somehow wage a kind of war on the other side, even if it means being illiberal in that war? Yeah. Well, uh, Michaela, uh, you're asking me for... Uh optimistic answers and I haven't got any. By the way, I wouldn't say what they had in Greece was liberal, but it was Republican in some way, or Rome for a while. Um, but yeah, liberalism is very fragile. I've always felt that. Um, we've lived in this country with a liberal constitution for so long that we tend to take it for granted, but it's not the norm and it needs a lot of protection. Now, what What's the upside? And I would say, well, why we survived for so long so well, I think had a lot to do with economic opportunity, with the American dream. 
And I'd had a lot to do with um, civic education as well, but the civic education wouldn't have worked unless people felt that you can come to America and while you may have a tough time, your kids will do better. Um, When that began in the recession of 2008, I mean, things have been fraying for a long time before that, but I think that's when a whole generation began to think, hey, we're being conned. Um, And that is really alarming. And if you're looking for where things could get better, I would say to the extent that um, people can again think that their kids are going to be better off than them, to the extent that in private life you can get ahead and you don't have to depend on the state, on politics, uh, to get you what you need, um, that would be very helpful. Uh, the economy before COVID was doing very well, uh, and what the good sign was, especially for minorities, for blacks and Hispanics, but uh, COVID uh, put the kibosh on that, and now we'll have to see whether the uh, you know money that's being pumped in was pumped in by Trump and being pumped in by Biden is going to help or hurt. Uh, well, that we'll get a short-range boom, I think, no question, but after that, who knows? But in the long run, it seems to me those are the two things, that people feel that the country's a good one for them personally and for their families, and that they understand why, that they're taught why and how it works and how it prevents war. Uh, right now, I'd say the outlook is very pessimistic because uh, the the it's questionable whether you know the American dream is over or not. I think I hope it isn't, but there are a lot of people who think it is. Um, and uh, the people who control civic education don't seem to know the point of the liberal state. Instead, they teach. Uh, I mean, the way in which critical racial theory has taken over higher education and the prep schools and and the high schools, public high schools, is astonishing to me because critical racial theory, whatever its merits or demerits, is not only illiberal, it is consciously, thematically, and theoretically hostile to liberalism. Uh, You read Edward Bonilla Silva, uh, Racism Without Racists, a classic of the genre, He'll tell you, uh, yeah, he'll just, he'll just quote Marx, uh, that uh, all these things, all the rights are simply uh, manifestations of power, and uh, we have to go beyond rights. Um, people like Ibram X. Kendi, who uh, tell you that uh, racism is, uh, you know, we have to have a, a department that will be able to take away things from people in order to equalize things by race. That means, obviously, property rights disappear, freedom of speech disappears. Um, the argument that uh, we are, we're for freedom of speech, but not freedom of speech we don't like, which we call hate speech. Uh, all of that, uh, the argument that if you don't agree with the critical racial theory view, you are a racist, that's really nothing other than the old Stalinist line You may think you're a Marxist, but you're wrong about the party line. It should be this way, and therefore you are objectively a counter-revolutionary. And that's essentially the argument as well. You are objectively a racist, even though they don't use the word objectively. And that means what Ring Lardner, as Ring Lardner describes it, shut up, he explained. Uh, There's one way, there's a correct way, we know what it is, get out of our way, we'll employ it. And anybody who is not with us is against us. That's thematically illiberal, and it's contemptuous of liberalism, because liberalism just gets in the way with all these uh, procedural safeguards. It's also directly analogous to the treatment of black people back in or before the civil rights movement, right? I mean, it's it's kind of like a reenactment in ideological form. Of that same kind of irrational well, I mean, discrimination. That's what I mean. Sure, and and people will say, well, yeah, but but it's compensatory, so it's okay. Um, we have to do what they did, and interestingly, you can see that on the right as well. I mean, put it this way: 
Aristotle talks about reciprocity. Liberalism is a mode of reciprocity. I won't hurt you if you won't hurt me. But if you do away with liberalism, you also have reciprocity. I'll hurt you more than you hurt me. Yeah, or I'll hurt you back even. It's to avoid that kind of feud warfare that liberalism has established. So on the right, um, I mean, I I read conservative blogs, and they they will say things like, it's time for us Republicans, for conservatives, to stop being so concerned with constitutional principles. They are are, are fighting us in in illegal and and, and immoral ways. Well, it's time to get tough. It's time to get tough. I'm going to buy guns. Um, it's demoralized, it's fantasy stuff, and it's very, very ugly. And we saw what that can look like on January 6th, which I have to say really shocked me. I didn't think that sort of thing was likely to happen from the right, and I was wrong. It did. And it's a token that they, too, are looking at the left and saying, you're violating the rules. Well, we're going to violate them too, and to hell with the rules. Um, it's it's mirror imaging, right. and uh, yeah, I mean when you when you raise the question of race, I mean is it, you know racism, um, the the real problem, not the real problem, but a, a, an issue is, and this is something that John McWhorter emphasizes a great deal. When you make the world one of evil victims with all the power. And innocent victims without power, yeah, which is essentially the picture. I mean, Kendi says if you attribute agency uh, responsibility to blacks, you're a racist. And McWhorter says that's racist. How dare you say that we don't have responsibility, that we don't have agency? What are we, children, animals? Um, you end up, as you say, reinscribing the very things you think you're fighting in the act of fighting against them. Yeah, and you don't you're not understanding that the root reason why it was wrong before is a is a principle that you're violating by trying to fix it. Right, but the argument is we know that, but we don't care. Because when we fixed it, it'll all be okay. Yeah? Um that sounds like the Ben Williams all over again. kind of What? I said, it just starts all like over a, again. Yeah, of course. Like a vendetta. Like yeah, it just, yeah, it's, it's, it's fuel justice, like, right? Right. That was the purpose of the modern state to end that sort of thing, to end feudalism and feud justice. Yeah. Um, I mean, even the something as primitive as, as the Code of Hammurabi, an eye for an eye. It sounds horrible. What it means is not two eyes for an eye. Yeah, not so there. Now you know how I feel, and here's one extra. And then it goes on from there. It escalates from there. It says, no, just just, just an eye. That's it. That's the first attempt to kind of limit all of this. Uh, and the problem is that from the point of view of the people who are attaining justice, everything was fine. But from the point of view of the people whom they took from, it's not fine. And that goes back to the fundamental political problem that the whole – and the part are not harmonious. The individual and the community, they're different points of view, and they have somehow to be accommodated, uh, or else it's just a matter of I have the power and I'm I'm, I'm dominating you. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm very pessimistic. Yeah. So when you look at the the current debates that we're having now, uh, it's just it is been tribalized it's it's like yeah uh when when uh people are looking at the Derek Chauvin trial generally speaking the right is in favor of Derek Chauvin <laughs> and dearly generally well, speaking well in some ways that that's that's what it comes down to yeah um when on the upper west side of new york you'll know this better than i of manhattan you you'll know this better than i uh the uh director of schools, whatever is the, the title is, uh, was going to take some uh, very nice uh, upper west side schools and maybe the competitive ones as well and, and uh, bring in people from uh, low-income areas. All these highly liberal parents started showing up and protesting and screaming about it. No, you can't do that. What about my kids? Yeah. 
Uh, that's always the problem. I mean, in the Soviet Union, you know, communism. But the kids of the nomenclatura, the kids of the ruling party f- officials, they weren't the ones going to Afghanistan to get shot at. Um, that That's the inherently private nature of human life that always defies attempts at making communitarianism and egalitarianism radical. And the only solution to that is probably technical. If you could do away with human reprodu- biological reproduction and just produce people in factories, you know, it might work because people wouldn't care about their kids. <laughs> yeah, well, that's not going to happen anytime soon. But uh, well, just a, it might. <laughs> that's a 1984 vision of yours, I guess. <laughs> But, uh, well, Brave New World's more like it, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. But I mean, you know, there there are these uh, folks, the transhumanists, who are looking forward to this sort of thing with a vengeance, and they insist it's pretty close. And I I, I don't know whether it is or not, but uh, uh, astonishing things are being done in the labs these days. And uh, the, what worries me is not, oh gosh, wouldn't it be great if we could do it? Uh, is what if we can do it? Um, Back in 1746, a French doctor called La Maitrie wrote a book that scared the hell out of Europe, and it was called Man the Machine, L'Homme Machine. And all the stories in the late 18th century, early 19th century about uh, Frankenstein, um, uh, human, you know, marionettes that look human and you know who's are we what, what what is a human being really are we just machines all that stuff came out of that book and it's possible i think you know that you that you could eventually turn human beings into dutiful cogs in 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 a, in a larger machine I mean, you know you could program them i i suppose and maybe that would be good but Maybe just being a, a retrograde human being, it seems to me there would be terrible, terrible losses. There might be more social justice, but I think there, human beings wouldn't be human anymore in the sense they wouldn't really have any kind of inwardness that's purely personal. Um, this is taking the, the discussion in a very, very extreme direction, but um, <laughs> no, I, I mean, you're talking what, I, about what I'm doing in effect is saying there's something to be said for allowing private, selfish interests some room. As Aristotle says, uh, you know, in, in Plato's Republic, there's communism. You know, in, in, in principle, it's just, but Aristotle says people take care of their own more than they do what belongs to others. You know, people care about their kids. And uh, the reason the tractor and the collective farm in East Germany was rotting in the fields and rusting in the fields is because it didn't belong to anybody. Yeah? It belonged to everybody, so nobody actually took it into the shed. Yeah? Uh, it's an Irish <laughs> proverb. A borrowed saw cuts everything. If it's not yours, you you don't care if you ruin it. Um, yeah. And collective ownership and collective membership is very faint. Um, so maybe there's something to be said for living with the problems of politics and selfishness um, as opposed to some grand solution that makes us all the same. Right. And and you want to keep individuality and, and, and that is the essence of humanity, at least as we value it in, in this society, but to try to erase it, to try to create some agreement is just doesn't seem worth it. Uh, but well, you ha- the joke is you need an agreement. You need an agreement how to deal with the disagreements. Yeah, that's why moderate agreements like liberalism, which give you some room to be selfish but put a limit, your selfishness can't go beyond this point. You can't hurt, some- you violate someone else's rights. It's awkward, and in some ways you could say self-contradictory, but that's why it works when there is consent for it. And when the circumstances aren't so dire that people are driven to to violate it for, because they they need to survive. 
Now, in terms of this cancel culture debate, uh, I, it seems as though what's occurred is that over the, let's say, all the way through the founding of this country, all the way from back until now, for the most part, the cancellations have been racially based. I mean, they've been, let's just say before the civil rights era, and there's, there was cancel culture. <laughs> and it was like, if you're black, you're canceled. Um, and now it's kind of more like if, you're, if your ideas are conservative, for example, you you could be easily canceled, um, and well, of course that's irking conservatives because it's it feels discriminatory and it is, and and so that so they're now turning to their own version of cancel culture by trying to find tried and true beliefs like America is the greatest and finding people that have criticized America in certain ways to try to cancel them because they said. You know, America was founded on slavery, for example. I think that came up in a recent uh, Senate hearing. And yeah, the and, 1619 project. Yeah, and and people who are espousing it are they're trying to get them canceled for being involved with that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think cancellation thing. So go ahead on, on that. What do you think about? That? I, I think I think we ought to separate a couple of things out. What we call cancel culture is shaming, excluding saying you do not belong in decent society. And every community, whatever it is, has rights of excommunication, banning, shunning. Uh, sometimes they're very formal, uh, you know, Orthodox Jews and the Amish, um, excommunication in the Catholic Church. Uh, it's always necessary to draw a line with the community saying, this is who we are, and if you don't buy these rules, then you are out. Uh, Benedict Arnold yeah, is a classic example of somebody whom liberal dem democracy in America shunned, shamed. Uh, I don't know if in high school we read this story, The Man Without a Country, uh, a man who had cursed the United States and was condemned to be on a ship and never be able to come back to America. The story about, you know, can communities find their identity in shunning, in canceling. That said, yeah, what was done to blacks, cancel culture doesn't come close to describing it. It wasn't shaming and shunning. It was not even admitting from the beginning that they were really human. Yeah, and treating them simply as things. And that, I, I wouldn't collate that into cancel culture. What we've got going now, though, and it has to do a lot with social media, is there is no community, but there is a kind of artificial universal community. Yeah, people don't actually know each other, but they, through Twitter, can dump on people and, and, and threaten their jobs because the employer is worried that people won't, uh, won't, won't buy from them. Um, and it is a kind of parody of what, shunning is like in a real community, uh, it's much more like what you get in a totalitarian society where um, anybody who steps out of line um, is in huge trouble. It's not so much a community, but it's something like the state. And that's an amazing thing, that society through through the media, through, through sorry, through social media, through Facebook and Twitter and so forth, has a kind of power almost like a state. And then you see the great institutions of the state, like the corporations, Coca-Cola, Gillette, beginning to say, oh, yeah, right, we've we got to go with this because the, the, this is our market. And um, it begins to have a kind of quasi-political power. Now, what you did, what went into is how you know the left – stigmatizes the right and the right stigmatizes the left uh yeah sure uh that's in a way been going on for a long time though um i would say at least since uh, the 2000 election it's a sign that liberal society is breaking up and liberal government is breaking down the impossibility of in people in Congress to uh, make compromises and to pass laws. Why? Because they're always appealing to the base. We talked, I think, uh, a couple of years ago about Trump 
uh, very much radicalized the discourse, but it was pretty radical already, and it makes it impossible uh, for people to get along because they have to constantly be, you know, shunning the other side and uh, showing that they're true believers to their to their base. Um, so I, it seems to me there are a lot of things being put together here. And yes, uh, conservatives feel uh, and have for a long time felt shunned and persecuted. If you're, uh, you know, a rich businessman or, or uh, an Appalachian farmer, uh, the odds are that you're gonna you're, you're gonna look like a villain, and anything comes out of Hollywood, and they resent it, and they 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 respond in kind. Sure, and and that's toxic, and it's and it's a problem, but. Um, it's it's a symptom, I'd say, more than the cause of anything. Yeah, it's a symptom of the divide, obviously, but it's yeah. also it it's also seems to me that, like you were saying, it's it's compensatory. It's it seems like, yeah, I, I think it was too weak a term to call what happened to African Americans as cancel culture, but. It was a part of it. It was it, it, they, it was cancel culture plus a lot more, but but it, it, I mean well, there was a cancellation of them on on that level, that yeah. same ideological level. I mean, it, or, or not ideological. I, I, but I guess I, I guess what, what what bothers me is that to cancel somebody, they have to have been uncanceled to begin with. It's an act of saying, "Get out! You don't belong! Shame on you!" You know, never darken okay. my door again. And with mean. blacks, they were never let in. <laughs> right. It was pre-canceled. <laughs> right. But, uh, right. But in, right. in any case, uh, the, the, so it, it, that's kind of the the people that are, they're trying to root out racists. They think that people, okay, this person holds a position of power. It looks like from what they espoused here that they might be racist. So to we already acknowledge that there might be systemic racism based on the fact that there are racists that have power. Uh, so if you find one, they're just like, all right, well, let's get that one out and maybe improve the the system. Yeah. And it's gone too far, I, obviously, but, but that's the idea, right? Well, that's part of the idea. I suspect there's another idea involved as well, which is not just to – attain the end of driving out the evildoer and intimidating anybody who might say the same thing yeah, or do the same thing. Not just the, the seizing of power, but also the message, we have the power. We can do this, and there's nothing you can do about it in return. Um, but that's the corruption, I, I, I mean – isn't it? Is it? Well, isn't there it's, it's, a line between that and the, like the genuine desire to improve things? Or there's? Are you saying yes, that there's, there's a line between it? But you 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 can you can blur that line, or you can say it is necessary for us in order to attain what we want to have power and to have intimidated all opposition and to keep them quiet. Yeah. Um, I'm just reading a play in, in class, uh, Buchner's Danton's Death, about the French Revolution, and there are speeches given to Robespierre and Saint Just, which are exactly that. Yeah, we must, you know, ter terror is virtue, and virtue is terror. Terror is the revolution. Yeah, um, terror is lovely and beautiful because we terrorize the bad people and keep them from from coming to power. Um, we are doing good by terrorizing other people. We need to do it. And if you're soft and weak, the place of Danton's death, Danton, who was a terrorist to begin with, is eventually executed because he gets sick of it. Uh, those people who haven't got the, the stomach and the guts to keep terrorizing other people, they're objectively counter-revolutionaries. <laughs> yeah, we have to kill them. Right. Uh, and, and it's a very old, old argument. There's... Um, a novel, a Russian novel by uh, Mikhail Bulgakov, a famous novel called The Master and Margarita. Do you know it? No, I don't. Oh, it's wonderful. I used to, I used to read it around every Easter. Uh, a guy goes into a Soviet store and asks, uh, "What's that? Is that fish fresh?" And the and the answer is, "It's second grade fresh." 
Well, second grade fresh came to be a term in the Soviet Union, meaning not fresh, rotten. It's a term for every official lie, yeah? And when the lie is so blatant, as in second grade fresh, it has a kind of quality like, you know that I'm lying, and you have to take it. You've got to buy this fish. You've got to eat it. You've got to pretend it's fresh, yeah? Because I've got the power. And that's politically very important to keep emphasizing how much power you have, how much you can dominate. You can't even say X, Y, Z. The power in being able to go and say, look, look, look at this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that the purpose of that is to display power, I think, as well as to get what you want done. Okay. But isn't that a dynamic in every kind of struggle? Uh, it seemed like union power is kind of based on that, you know, the fear of the walkout, the fear of mass. Unrest. No, this is different. I mean, that's right. The union says, if you don't give us our demands, we're walking out. And the owner says, if you walk out, you lose your jobs, and we may lock you out anyway. But everybody knows that eventually there's a deal there on the table that can be struck. The threat is really important. But the threat, you don't actually want to go that far. Yeah. Um, in the armory, it's the ultimate weapon. Yeah. Uh, you don't use it all the time uh, precisely because you're in a liberal situation where in principle you ought to be able to work it out. This isn't about working it out. This is about excluding, intimidating, dominating. Uh, it, it presumes war, whereas the union negotiation presumes peace okay i can see but where is the is, is there a way to arrive at a similar dynamic that allows for at least some kind of uh intimidation yeah yeah uh, with, with yeah, because i feel like peaceful protest is i guess that right the non-violent yeah. protests yeah Right. Um, there are. There's always a gray area in in liberalism. Uh, how far can you go? Nonviolent protest. Can you actually break the law? Big argument. Martin Luther King. Yes. Other people said no. Um, but when you're that, that's a very different thing than um, out and out warfare. Is there a way to get back to it? That that of course is the question. But, I mean, one philosopher said there is a difference between an extreme proposition within one body of thought and that proposition made the center of another body of thought. Yeah? Um, protest, yeah, fine. But how far do you take it uh, into violence? What, what then? So I think it was Vox or somebody, and, and somebody put the two things uh, one last summer, they had a uh, uh, kind of a chin stroking article about, well, gee, violent protest may not be good, but in some ways it can produce social justice, and that's a good thing. And then after January 6th, my God, no, violence, that's terrible. Um, <laughs> you know, right. which is it? Um, so the, the, the question is, how do you get back to uh, where breaking the rules is in the rules up to a point as a kind of threat, but basically you're trying to cut a deal. Uh, and the answer is with enormous difficulty uh, because the usual answer is we'll show them and we'll reciprocate. But that doesn't, that doesn't bring peace. That just leads to escalation on the other side again. Um, and when you're fighting a holy cause, it's not useful to offer concessions either because they're accepted and not respected. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, at least that's the, that's what's said, but I mean, there has been progress based on 
such movements. Like now we've been seeing in the streets here uh, an array of sometimes in the same city on one side, you have some very peaceful protesters and then down the road, it's just pure mm-hmm. mayhem. And mm-hmm. it's hard to, as, as you were saying, like the, the people that feel wronged, they feel that their cause is so just and so has gone so long that the peaceful protests haven't worked. You know, they have that right. idea. And right. so w- why right. should we continue this thing that's not working? Let's really scare them. And right. I mean, I think there's an element, there has to be at least in the back of mind of every judge of every juror, the idea that if we let this guy Chauvin off, mm-hmm. there's going to be some violent stuff going on and we don't want that. Mm-hmm. So that's going to influence right. the decision. I mean, that's wrong. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be the thing that decides the case, but it's, it's going to be there. And that's considered to be a victory. I mean, cause the guy gets prosecuted for killing this guy he shouldn't have been sitting on, you know? So it, mm-hmm. is there, is there, isn't there some moral room in there for, for that kind of intimidation? I well, mean, I, uh, here I'd go to something that the French political scientist, sociologist, philosopher, Raymond Aron said, and in saying it, he was, I think, in a tradition of thought that goes from Aristotle through Montesquieu up through uh, Tocqueville and to James Caesar, who's a Kenyan grad and wrote a wonderful book about liberal democracy and political science. He said, the essential political question is the regime question. Is the regime tolerable? Then it the laws have to be obeyed. Uh, every time you violate the law, and certainly violate it with, with, with violence, you are attacking the legitimacy of the regime. Uh, and the regime should put you down. And loyal citizens should put it down. If the regime is not tolerable, then revolution is both allowable and perhaps even necessary. And then the regime must be toppled by any means necessary, including violence and probably involving violence. There's no gray area there. Um, And that, I think, is fundamentally right. And then the next thing is that the onus for that choice is very, very heavily on whoever wants to change a regime because the costs of changing it in human terms are usually enormous and what comes out of it is rarely much better than what went before. Um, There's an awful lot to be said for maintaining even, you know, certainly imperfect because all regimes are imperfect, but even very imperfect regimes. If you don't know what's coming, the czar was bad. Stalin was worse. The Shah was bad. I would think most Iranians would probably agree that what's come after is worse. Um, the King of France wasn't anything to write home about. Um, the terror, not so good. Probably worse. Um, Napoleon, yes and no. So that that's really, I think, the where you, where you draw the line. Now, as I understand it, the Antifa protesters are very clever. Um, they're using violence really as a provocation, as a way of uh, trying to get the police to overreact and thus become the bad guys. They're using it within the regime. They're using it um, not in an open attempt at bringing it down because they're not strong enough to do so, but I think the purpose is, is plain enough to delegitimize the regime and eventually to overthrow it. Um, so that's, that's the question. And I would, you know, my judgment, but you know, I'm white and I'm old. Um, my judgment is that after the civil rights act, after the voting rights act, and after generation of affirmative action, which shows that the, that people are willing to discriminate against themselves for the sake of social justice, overthrowing this regime 
in the name of creating a somehow better one is very, very unlikely to make a lot of sense. And therefore, I would say violent protest is not justified. Yes, I agree with that. I think, though, that it's in the they look at it like just, well, you know, we tried these peaceful protests and they're not listening. Yeah. And, and but even though it's wrong, like, ju- and it's not justified, it's effective in the short term. Yes. A li- and so it, that's, I mean, that's partly what's contributing to this problem that we're talking about. But it, yeah. it just seems I mean, like there's yeah. something one should talk about here, which is guilt. It's effective to the extent that there are a lot of people, usually living in neighborhoods that are not affected directly, who feel, well, as you do, well, they've got a good cause, and you know, da, and who am I to say, and da 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 da. Uh, The trouble with guilt is that it has a sell-by date, that the actual effect of guilt, I think, is ultimately to make you hate the people who make you feel guilty. I think the recent outburst, outburst, the recent wave of anti-Semitism has an awful lot to do with Holocaust guilt. It becomes unbearable. And then the people who you actually are hurting the small business owners yeah, in, in some of the cities, uh, they're going to hate you in, in, the, in the simplest possible way. And I think if violence feels good, it feels like you're expressing yourself, you're finally able to throw off the bonds of, of, of you know, meekness and niceness and servility and, and really, really uh, say who you are. But expressive politics is not smart politics. And I think the people who led the civil rights movement from Frederick Douglass all the way through down to Baird Rustin, um, they understood that. Boy, did they understand that. If you read uh, Douglass's magnificent uh, what, to the Bl- what to the Slave is the Fourth of July speech, uh, it is an amazing example of somebody who is going to denounce in the most extreme terms, he says. But he also says, not a word will leave, will leave my lips that a, that a rational and unprejudiced human being w- would not accept. Uh, it's an amazing effort in bridging that gap between indignation and rationality. Uh, it's, it's an amazing piece of rhetoric, not for the argument, but for how it shows what kind of a man Douglas was and that he was not just equal, but he was a superior human being. And this has been, you know, King and Rustin and all of them knew that that was the way it had to go, that expressive politics makes you feel good, uh, especially if you're not really taking any big risks yourself. Uh, I remember in the 1960s, the Columbia students who, who uh, took, a, took a, uh, the administration building over, oh, it felt so great, community, we're all together here, spirit of the trenches, but nobody was, you know, there was no poison gas coming their way. It felt really good, but it doesn't actually help anybody very much on the whole, I would say. And I think what's the, the kind of stuff that was done this summer is, is, is in fact, very sophisticated and very politically smart um, in that they don't really blow anything up big, big time. They're not murdering people. They're, they're stopping short, for the most part, of, uh, of, of, of hurting people. They're mostly hurting property. Um, but even so, the effect is ultimately to radicalize, to polarize, and bring on real war. Right, and they they handed the central campaign slogan to the Republican Party in the 2020 election. So yeah, you know, though I I'm not too worried. I wouldn't worry too much about the Republicans anymore, <laughs> in the sense that they seem to me to be really in receivership. Um. You you've got and you know, the the amount of the power that Trump had over the party is how much uh, I, I didn't realize that he had so much power, and that you've got a large part of the Republican Party that is acting out now that is 
uh, simply sort of mirroring the left and, and making defiant gestures. And to some extent, that's scary, and to some extent, it's pathetic. And the rest of the Republican Party seems shell shocked. I, I, maybe, maybe they're they're too they're they're too afraid of their their Trumpist base. They're also facing the threat of violence from their side of people that are exactly. you know yeah. they get the same threats yeah. they get they get very hate filled threats if they do anything outside of the Trump. And Liz Cheney. Yes, uh, perfect the, example. The, the the grief she's taking for having uh, supported impeachment. Yeah, no, I mean it, th- this is what happens. This is why. In revolutionary situations, moderate – often the first regime is moderate, and it falls. French Revolution, yeah, you had a couple of moderate governments, the Marquis de Lafayette, the Foyon. The Iranian Revolution, nobody remembers, but the first couple of, of, of leaders were moderates, were moderate liberals. In the Russian Revolution, Kerensky, yeah. Uh, why? Because they're – the fact – the revolution isn't over. Uh, the fight isn't over. The, the the people who are trying to say, let's be nice and can't we all get along? No, we don't want to get along. We want to kill each other. Um, and so that's, I think, the problem of the so-called moderate Republicans and the very few moderate Democrats that are, that are still around. And what counts as moderation has gotten... Uh, extended to right and left a great deal, it seems to me. We're not talking Jacob Javits and Joseph Lieberman. <laughs> no. So, I don't know. Maybe Republican candidates will do well in 2022, but as a party, they seem to me to be paralyzed right now. Yeah, but they did particularly, or at least uncharacteristically well in the undercard. And maybe What that, that was... actually means, though, I, I don't know, especially in, in national politics. And I mean, I, I, after Trump won, I gave up trying to predict anything about American politics. I have no idea, you know, what will happen. So I should probably get out of the business. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's it, it, we can trace the Trump effect from starting at maybe Newt Gingrich's time. Um, all the just in terms of the way that they've decided to orient themselves in opposition, and then it was this kind of like slash and burn uh, mentality, and then it, it sort of culminated with a Trump. I thought, and, and I didn't think that. I thought they the way the media looked at Trump, it was kind of like he was this anomaly in the Republican Party. But how there's been these trend of what Trump was doing from the beginning, from at least the 90s. Yeah, I'll buy that. Uh, but I do think you had a qualitative shift of a radical nature with Trump. I mean, I think he was absolutely, it would have been it would incomprehensible somebody like that could who talked like that and who acted like that who had no political experience. Um could become could become president could take could win the republican nomination but you're right when you start playing the tough guy game sometimes it takes you places way beyond where you want to go or where you thought it could go the only thing i would add to that is that i think it was mutual the the fighting about the 2000 election uh, bush hitler all of that um the uh the bork hearings um the Clarence Thomas hearings, I think, you know, people don't realize how much rage they create on the other side by things they do that they feel are justified. The Kavanaugh hearing, people on the right felt that there is absolutely no limit on what the left will do. These are totally unprincipled and horrible people. And at the same time, folks on the left thought, this guy, Kavanaugh, is an absolute monster. How dare you? How can you put him up? I would say that things like the Thomas hearing radicalized, enraged, an awful lot of more moderate conservatives. And I think people on the left didn't understand what was happening. So this has been a reciprocal business on both sides. Uh, I since, think- since, hard to say when, since maybe the Clinton impeachment. Maybe that's where the Republicans... Uh, you know, went off the rails first. I, I don't know. But it just seems like that as there seems to be dwindling, like the, the party that's in that's ebbing in popularity, 
is the one that gets a little more extreme usually. I mean, that's usually how it goes. But here we're seeing both sides kind of moving in, in an extreme direction. Uh, that's, yeah, I mean, that when the liberal consensus vanishes, you start getting into a very strange world. And the idea that, of course, you have to move to the middle. Well, Biden moved to the middle in the campaign, and that may well have won it for him. But he's not governing from the middle particularly. Now, what that will do, how that will affect things in 2024, I don't know. But he can't um, govern. He people can't talk govern about the Overton before. window. You know, the Overton window may be shifting, and it may be shifting in both directions. Who knows? But ahead, he can't. Sir. No, I was just saying he can't govern from the middle because there's really, I mean, there's very few Republicans that are going to identify themselves in the middle. They, they want to put themselves in the middle. Um, well, I mean, yes and no. But, for instance, um, Tim Scott, conservative Republican and black from South Carolina, uh, had a uh, you know prison reform bill and sentencing reform bill, I believe it was, and the Democrats just filibustered it to death. Um when it came to the infrastructure bill, there were Republicans who were willing to offer, you know, alternatives that were just neglected. When it came to the COVID relief bill, again, the Republicans had a $600 billion bill that they were willing to go for. Um, I think the argument, move, oh, you can't right? govern from the center, the Republicans won't help. It's a convenient one. I don't buy it altogether. But they weren't going to move from that. They were going. To, they were saying six hundred, and that's it. Uh, like they did well, last time. That's what that's what the uh, union says, and that's what the management says when you start a negotiation. But uh, you, you don't admit you're going to you're going to budge from it. Uh, you try to negotiate, and you see what happens. Right, right. I th I mean, I I thought Biden. I mean, I I think you genuinely wanted to get the COVID relief done without Republicans. And he, he made a show of, of having um, a bipartisan thing going on. But now with this uh, infrastructure plan, it's just, it, it's fundamentally different ideologies about what is infrastructure that is blocking this problem. So it's kind of hard. Well, to is, it, is, is it really a question of ideologies, what in infrastructure is? I mean, it's a term that people have used for a long, long time, to mean roads and bridges. Uh, if you now mean to turn it into how people feel about themselves, uh, my guess is it's not a difference of interpretation. It's so using what do you mean? one what thing that? to do something else. What is the, the provision that is making people feel good about themselves? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> but my sense is an awful lot of money is going... Um, into soft targets rather than hard. Non-roads. I mean, the idea is that um, elder care is infrastructure. Um, uh, a broadband is infrastructure. Uh, yeah. Electrical yeah. grid. I think that's a little different. Okay. Well, that's that's where the the disagreement is 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 yeah. happening. Obviously, is it just on the Republican side? Is it just that they've reacted to the left excesses or is there something in in them that's just there's some ideology that has caught on that was there, a kernel of it? Yeah, I mean, sure. some would call I mean, it fascism. Look, <laughs> well, I mean, fascism is a word that. Orwell already in the 40s was saying doesn't mean anything anymore. It's just a term of insult. So I'd be careful about it. But I, I you mean populism, collectivism? Yeah, and I'd say that's been there Sorry. since Gingrich. Yeah. That's also reactionary. People on the left always say the Republicans or conservatives are reactionary. They're right. Uh, it's a reaction to a sense of powerlessness. Um, and it's a rallying, and we're resolute, and we're not these these liberal rhinos, Republicans in names only. Um, it's a sign of 
it's a sign of feeling the times are getting away from them. It isn't Reagan time anymore. Uh, we're gonna, we, we, we're beleaguered. We're gonna fight. So it is both. Yes, that's there, and it can lead to quasi-fascist behavior in the most extreme form. Yes, absolutely. Um, and it's also a matter of reaction to changes that they feel that they're out of control with. Uh, so yes, you're right, but it doesn't. Every, everything is reactive as well. You know, I mean, everything on the left is reactive too. Uh, why is it that the situation of, of, of minorities hasn't improved even after the Civil Rights Act, even after affirmative action? It's got to be something fundamental. It's got to be structural. We've got to deal with that. Yeah? Um, it's a similar kind of fear that leads to kind of false resolution and anger. Um, but, uh, I think but the Tea I Party was, was a warning of that. Go ahead. <laughs> But I don't notice the authoritarian side. I mean, maybe it's taken another form, but in terms of rallying around a central leader and he's going to be the god emperor, as many Trump supporters called him, that aspect is just different on on the right than the left, isn't it? I think so. I think so. And I think part of the reason is that – Part of it's a matter of social class. I mean, the left. I mean, there, there are folks on the left who are, you know, some of the democratic socialists. They are old-fashioned. What about the workers, proletarians? Yeah. Um, they may be a little out of date, but that's what they care about. But the rest of the left is tends to be kind of upper class and upper class in its tastes, and they already control. The universities, the churches, the museums, uh, you know, the, old, the foundations, um, and you know, some of the big corporations, the media, the uh, high tech corporations, big tech corporations. It's hard for them not to play the role of what what John McWhorter calls the elect. We just know better. We're just cooler. I mean, you guys are clingers to your guns and your religion. Uh, you, you're just crazy. Uh, we're cool. And I think that takes away the need for that frenzied, you know, finder of a, of, of, of a god king. Although they kind of found it in Bernie a little bit. Yeah, I mean, that, that's where I think the, uh, the, the the folks I was talking about at the beginning uh, looked at, at and uh, they, they found something like that in Bernie. Now, you know, he was, you know, and Obama, too, to some extent. I mean, when he was glorified as, you know, Lincoln or, or God or, or um, they, they wanted, I think, to, to, to deify him to some de- to a considerable degree. But it didn't have that that sort of edge that that the Trumpian stuff has, because I think they know that they're in charge. So once you feel like you're out of charge, you're you're more apt to rally around a central figure and engage in authoritarian type. Well, that's where policy. messianic movements tend to come, you know, from the the, the folks who have given up hope for uh, winning at the normal game of politics. Yeah. Uh, that, that's, that's where the, I mean, who, who was it? Who, who, who were the classes that supported the Nazis? They were the classes, the lower middle class, the people who had been um, battered by the war and then the inflation. And then finally were out of work with the depression they're the ones who, you know, long for a Messiah, who will, someone who will save them, and, and they're the ones who turn to Hitler. Um, that's Marx was wrong. The the dis the declassed lower bourgeoisie does not become proletarian and communist. Uh, they they became fascists. Uh, so yeah, uh, somebody who's going to bring back coal. Somebody who's going to Make Youngstown live again. Um, 
These are people who are on very short, small margins, and life is tough, and so they they do what people have always done in that situation. They tend to put their hopes on a heroic figure who will bring about the end of days and avenge and make sure that those fancy people get uh, get what they deserve. This is a passage from Augustine, from, from the city of God, that, that always horrified me. Uh, one of the pleasures of the saved, according to Augustine, is to look down through... The, Presumably through the plexiglass floor of heaven and watch the sinners writhing in hell. <laughs> um, I mean, that's you'll get yours, yeah. Uh, that that's that's always part of it, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, it it seems like also that authoritarianism often arises out of the personality of the leader that gets chosen. Um, I, I think there's a fundamental aspect of Trump that is causing it as well. Um, and I think that just because yeah, he sure. can't... Uh, he's the guy who is willing to speak the truth and speak it plainly. Uh, what you look for in such a person, I mean, people like Trump and Hitler are supremely unattractive human beings to most people. But it's that fanaticism and that vulgarity and the, the willingness to break the old barriers that's so attractive. I talked about expressive politics on the left. We're now talking about expressive politics on the right. It's the same thing. He makes me feel like I'm somebody. Yeah, and it's 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 tremendously effective. And what what I've also noticed is that it's somehow taken over the minds of I wouldn't call like Trumpers at all, but a lot of people who say, "Well, I like his policies. I didn't care for the person, but." His policies were good, and so I support him, and I would support him again. Well, I mean, that's a problem because, you know, if you are – if you think that a lot of the uh, uh, economic measures that delayed the recovery so long that, that uh, Obama took uh, through uh, his phone and his pen, as he said – and then Trump reversed them, and then the economy got quickly better. Uh, well, gee, that that's something to think about. If you think that uh, uh, everybody, Bush and everybody else, gets us into wars and keeps us there, and Trump didn't, and that matters to you, well, that makes a difference. If you don't like liberal jurisprudence and you think you're going to like uh, people like Kavanaugh better, then it does make a difference. If you are somebody who uh, doesn't like the appeasement of Iran and Trump stopped it, well, gee, that's going to make a difference. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't associate them with the, with the other crowd. I thought that most Republicans who were voting for Trump were voting for him holding their nose and voting on the grounds of policy. But they were voting in, well, you know, I, I really don't like uh, what, what Obama did, and I really don't like what uh, I see the Democrats pushing, uh, so I guess i got to hold my nose and vote for them. That's very different, I think, than uh, the people who put their hopes in, in a messiah. Well, I mean, it's true, but there's, I guess it's just the uncanny ability of these very rational people to overlook the danger that comes, that you recognize as a never Trumper. Well, uh, I, I, I think a lot of, I mean, I thought more perhaps than actually were, were very alive to that and uh, may, had a very tough choice. Uh, now, what the proportion is, I don't know. I, I thought it was most people voting for him. I seem to be wrong. But I just think that to to believe that there, the trade-off is okay, that you can tolerate a kind of person like this being president just for those policies, to me, is it, it, there's something flawed in your character if, if – if you would go there. I mean, I, I don't well, want it to mean that's anybody. That's always the question you, that, that you may be right. But, uh, you know, when you have a very tough choice and, you know, you, it's it very easy to look at, uh, at, at Biden and say that this is, this guy's no, uh, 
and I'm not terribly clean either, and all the rest of it. And you think, of what, what's the future of the country? Character matters. That's no question. Character matters enormously. Uh, but so does policy. And I'm inclined in this area to give people uh, a fair amount of leeway. When, when choices are that tough, uh, I can understand good reasons for going both ways. Even after January 6th? Well, the election was held before January 6th. No, but after I'm January 6th, I think perfectly again. clear he, sh- he should have been impeached that night. That's what commentary said. Um, January 6th was what everybody had been waiting for the other shoe to fall, and it never did quite. And then on January 6th, it did, yeah. I understand, but I, you still have a lot of moderate Republicans that would vote for him again after that. Well, again, I don't know. I mean, to what extent are they office holders who uh, think that the party has become so Trumpoid that they have to go along? Uh, to what extent do they really would they really go along? I'm looking uh, for poll. I'm looking at polling. Yeah, and and people say yes, they would vote for Trump again. Yeah, that, that's scary. I, I'm, I'm hoping, like anything, that, that uh, they come up with a better candidate next time out. Well, that's the thing. I just wonder, what is the mentality of overlooking just the behavior post-election? I mean, it was just monstrous. Yeah. It was beyond anything he'd ever done as president, I think. Yeah, no, I agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, he undermined the Constitution. He undermined faith in the regime by constantly pushing this. Uh, On the flip side, I will say that the efforts of the Democrats to loosen up election laws uh, was designed to create paranoia, and it did. Uh, That said, I think Biden won quite legitimately, but uh, there was something reckless about that as well. But, yeah, I mean, this is what you have when people, when you have a demoralized political situation, and you you were saying, well, why can't we, why can't those Republicans be more reasonable? And uh, uh, the 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 tension is that they feel that they're not being met with reasonableness on the other side, and you're. Uh, And you're saying, well, yes, we are being reasonable. Biden is a moderate, reasonable president. Um, mm-hmm. uh, could be, but I'm withholding judgment for you know a year or so. Right. No, I, I'm not suggesting that uh, he's perfect, but I mean it more like after. Jan- I don't even just leaving Biden out of it. It's just that. Yeah. It's, there's something about I know. that I know. that, that yeah. moment. I mean, it happened to Liz Cheney, right? She's one of the yeah. most partisan yeah. Republicans you'll see. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and it just, it's, what do you think it is psychologically that keep, is it, you're saying that it might just be no one's willing to voice this opinion just because they're a fear, they're, like at least the prominent Republicans. But it just seems like, in, why would people lie to pollsters over this? seems like that that wouldn't happen it's it's it's, uh certainly it wouldn't lie that way yeah no if anything they'd lie the other way um yeah i think it's a sign of demoralization i think it's a sign of this kind of false uh we're we're not scared because we have our champion and we'll fight to the end and you know south will rise again and that that sort of thing uh it's a kind of demoralized defiance because I thought and for sure it would – I thought his his popularity would, would drop tremendously among Republicans after that. And it, I don't think it dropped at all, <laughs> maybe a little bit. Yeah. Um, that said, what cost him the election, I think, was precisely his character. Uh, I think it's, you know, in the suburbs, the, uh, the well-to-do Republicans voted for Biden. And um, and to some extent, we're getting a kind of class uh, division where where he did better among Hispanics and blacks than anybody expected. 
Uh, but he lost the suburban vote. So maybe those people are now Democrats. I don't know. Uh, people like uh, Bill Kristol, yeah, who's a uh, neoconservative, a friend of mine, and uh, prominent never Trumper, has now joined the Democrats. And I, I'm very interested to see how many of those people now become openly Democratic. Now, finally, this is a big issue, so we don't have to really go long on this. But the one of the aspects of structural racism that a lot of people are talking about now is all these Republican voting laws that have come into effect. Uh, they're trying to limit. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're 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 concerned with fraud and rightfully so. But the way that they're targeted, it looks very looks like they're trying to stop black people from voting as much. Uh, so like, what is, what do you, how do you, what's your view on that kind of effort going on? Uh, that, that's a hell of a thing to finish with, as you said, because it opens everything up wide open. Uh, take the Georgia law, for example. Uh, it has now become apparently gospel on the left that to ask for voter ID is racist. I find that bizarre. Um, The Georgia law requires voter ID, which seems like most European democracies require it. It's it's easily obtainable. I see no reason. It seems to me a good check to make sure the the election is honest. Um, The business about not being able to give people food or drink within 150 feet of the polls is Standard stuff, and in fact, they do make water available. Uh, it's designed from back in the 19th century. People used to buy votes in, in, in America and Britain, certainly in Britain, uh, by, by giving voters beer. Um, it's, a, it's a looser law in many ways in terms of early voting and mail-in voting than what New York has. So it's... So it's a question to me, what are we talking about? Um, the My own sense is I'm distrustful of vote harvesting, of unguarded ballot boxes, and I think they tend to make other people distrustful and delegitimize elections. I think it's important for elections that they not just be clean, but that they are seen to be clean. Uh, I don't see that as anti-democratic. I see that as pro-democratic. But, okay, yeah. So just... what are we talking about as voter suppression? Uh, things like making sure, checking the rolls, making sure that people are still there. Um, I don't see that in the Georgia law. Um, and so that there has been a fight about what the voting rules should be, and that those may well have effects on minority voters, I'm willing to buy in principle, but I'm not clear on what it is, say, about the Georgia law that's so heinous. Well, no Sunday voting? No Sunday voting. Well, gee, I mean, we used to have voting on Tuesdays, one Tuesday, you vote. Um you vote on Saturday. We have had a two-day weekend here forever. If you're working Sunday, you'll have another day off. There are plenty of early voting days. That's That seems to me stretching it to say, ooh, racism. That, that, that's that's I mean, minority sold, exclusion. That's souls to the polls day, right? Sorry? I mean, sorry? Isn't that souls to the polls day? I mean, for a lot of black voters. Well, why can't that be some? I mean, I mean, if you go out of church and you vote. I don't. I mean, I, I really don't see that. It seems to me if you want to vote, you can vote a lot of other times. That that that's pushing it. It seems to me. Okay, and it's but the the net effect, and I don't think this escapes Republicans putting these votes in these laws in, which there might be on facially completely legitimate. And they probably are. But the idea is that the net effect, and I don't think that they would be enacting these laws if the net effect weren't this. 
the net effect is fewer constituencies that they don't want voting are voting. I mean, right? I, I don't. I, I don't know why that should be. I mean, you, you say that's true, but we don't had in this past election an amazingly effective. Uh, machinery run by big tech in the cities to get out the minority vote. And it had a tremendous effect. And I don't see why that wouldn't be continued and why that that would not keep up. Um, I think what's behind these laws, from a Democratic point of view, you say they're trying to cut out the minorities. From the point of view of the Republicans, uh, they're thinking those Democrats, they're cheating in every way they possibly can. Um, They changed the rules in Michigan. They changed the rules in Pennsylvania. The judges wouldn't hear it, but those are crooked changes. Uh, They're operating defensively, and so are – I mean, that's what always happens. Both sides think of themselves as on the defense and as innocent victims. We could raise a parallel problem, redistricting, yeah, uh, gerrymandering those evil republicans they're gerrymandering well yeah they are they sure are and the Repu- the democrats did it back in the old days they it was the burton brothers in california who showed you how to do it um so we'll have commissions that are that are by that are bipartisan but they have to be an odd number and the ruling party always gets to name the the odd voter um there there are problems of democratic process and procedure that can't be handled without good faith. And what we're just what you were just talking about now, and it gets us back to the beginning of our discussion, is that when there's no trust anymore on either side, uh, it's impossible to arrive at mutually acceptable procedures because each side thinks that the other is malign and cheating. Right, right. And and it's, I mean, it didn't help, obviously, to have Trump be like, don't, all the mail-in votes are fraudulent. But No, to me, Trump poured gasoline on a, on a fire that was already going. Trump has a lot of responsibility, and Trump is, as you say, both symptom and cause. Um, but to me, sure. But, but to me, why would you kind of take that cue as a Republican policymaker and say, okay, let's make it, let's, it's fine. We'll require ID for, um, for mail-in voting. But in some cases, in some of these laws, they just eliminated it as, as an option, or at least you had to go through a, a series of uh, yeah. strict uh, checks to get the mail-in yeah. vote as if mail-in voting is somehow bad, which is, I don't, I don't see any evidence of that. So, why why curb that? Well, I mean, you say, why would they follow Trump? Again, Trump is symptom as well as cause. Uh, the distrust of elections, it's 2000, the floating, you know, the hanging chads. Yeah, of course. Right. Uh, the Democrats questioned that election. 2004, they questioned the ballot boxes in Gambier, Ohio that didn't work. Right. Um, 2016, and I, we haven't mentioned this, but the whole Russia collusion business has had an enormous effect. Uh, if you, I, I don't know what, what you think about that, but if you look at, uh, I think the place to look is in commentary, Eli Lake, an article called Trump Framed But Guilty. Um, but the demoralizing effect that that has on the Republicans to see the Democrats not accepting the election of Republican presidents. And then there are sort of all kinds of stories in lore about, about recounts where every uh, vote was, that came out was registered for the Democrats. Um, Republicans are as touchy as Democrats about this. Democrats felt they were cheated in 2000, felt they were cheated in 2004, felt they were cheated in 2016. And Republicans feel exactly the same way about 2020. And I would look at it less as who's right, who's wrong, but as two very demoralized sets of people who don't trust each other and are frightened. 
I see. So it's it's not rationality of any sort. It's kind of irrationality on both well, sides. Well, it's, it's rationality of a certain kind inflected with a lot of fear and anger. So do you do you encounter um, moderate Republicans that believe that the election was not kosher? I have friends, I don't know if you call them moderate Republicans, they're pretty conservative, and a couple of them early on, I haven't heard from them since after uh, January, uh, early on they were highly suspicious. Oh, just because of the the mail-in stuff? Um, yeah, and some of the stuff that came out about the counting. Do you know the dispatch? It's a Never Trump operation. No. They made a point of of following up. It's Jonah Goldberg, people from the National Review. Um, they made a point of following up every claim of voter fraud. And they did a really good job of dispelling them and saying, look, no, sorry, Biden won. That's how it had. That's how it was. And my guess is that at this point, my friends would accept that. Uh, but in the beginning, they, they were suspicious. You know. I see. Uh, it just seems like um, it, there's just it, polling wise, uh, it's not showing. It's seeing that they're not accepting it. <laughs> Like it's it's kind of like an article of yeah no it, it has become and I, I thought from the beginning from from the very very beginning I thought to myself that if the Republicans make 2020 into what the Democrats have made the past three elections it's going to be disastrous for the Republican Party yeah uh, the Democrats have been holding on and for the country the Democrats have been holding on to the 2000 grudge for 20 years. Uh, and in fact, a uh, recount was done by all the leading newspapers, by the New York Times and the Miami Herald, whatever it is, uh, and they came to the conclusion, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, Bush did win. But it is article faith of, of, of liberal Democrats that they were cheated. And if that happens in 2020, and it looks like it has happened, that Republicans believe as a matter of faith that they were cheated – both parties then have shown that they fundamentally distrust the democratic process. And that's frightening. And it's arguably the cause of 9-11, right? Because I think they were looking back when they were looking at this kind of bad transition, they were looking back at that one and it took a while for it to be resolved. And maybe that's where things were missed. So can have well, I mean, I think things were missed at the level of the FBI and the CIA that hated each other so much they wouldn't cooperate in in, in, in figuring out what was going on. But I, I mean, there there are books about this that suggest it was at the at the operational bureaucratic level that it all went to, to pot and probably would again today. Um, no, my point but, is, yeah, the, uh, my my general point is that it weakens the country to have. This oh, yeah. division. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree entirely. Uh, that that uh, and it weakens the country not just in terms of immediate policy, but deep down, deep down, where you were, you know, people were were uh, putting up in Mount Vernon, Ohio, they were putting up uh, signs saying "Not Biden, Joe Biden, not my president." Same way that people were saying "Trump, not my president." Well, then you're in trouble. Okay, so in closing here, we're gonna we were talking about illiberalism and and how liberalism is so important for the functioning of a democracy, uh, and we're, and we people well, it is who democracy. it's a liberal democracy, right? <laughs> right? Sorry, it's synonymous, but the idea is that the the liberal discourse that we 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 enjoyed and that is now being um, censored in many ways on both sides, but uh, the left is pushing harder because they have the corporations on their side and the, the general public. Uh, although I've heard that the the view of racism is shared only by eight percent of the population, <laughs> yes. like that, yeah, that no, is right. embodied in this. Um, that's right, of, and majorities of minorities. I mean, blacks. They have never polled favorably for discrimination in favor of blacks. 
And that gives me a lot of hope in the sense that they're saying, look, we can compete. We don't need favors. Thank you very much. Give us a fair, a fair shot, and we'll do fine. Well, now, what a fair shot is, of course, is, is, is it may be to some extent at issue, but that's a hopeful sign. Right. And I think that you were saying, too, that if we can get our economic house in order and improve upward mobility, that that will go a long way in kind of tamping down I don't even know if it'll go a long way anymore, but it'll go some way. I mean, I, I, I would, I would sure hope that that would help. Yeah. Though they seem to be still pretty high during economic good times, uh, it, it didn't seem like the the prosperity of the Trump administration made them go down. But maybe that was part of Democrats. Well, that was Trump. I mean, he he picked at the wound every five minutes. For his own purposes. You know, I can imagine a Biden administration succeeding with its economic policies, moving the Overton window left, and, you know, it's kind of an era of slightly, somewhat social democratic, with an awful lot of left piety, but still, you know, people getting used to it, saying, okay, fine, this is all right. I could imagine that happening. I don't think it's likely, but it's possible. Oh, interesting. So more likely, what do you see happening? As I say, I don't, I don't want to predict anymore. Uh, I'm, as I say, I'm pessimistic about the body politic. I'm pessimistic about Constitution. And the ultimate reason I am is that I don't think that the elite of this country has been educated to know what liberalism is about. What's most likely, and I, I fear, is an oligarchy of a kind of the rich and the educated, a meritocratic oligarchy that has a rationale and an ideological justification of egalitarianism. But that that egalitarianism is mostly verbal and actually isn't going to help people, the people they say they're going to help very much. Again, John McWhorter talks about this a good deal. You know, using the right pronouns, using the right nomenclature does not get jobs or a better life for people in the inner city. And the question, of course, is whether the socialist, socialistic, egalitarian, redistributive programs that we will get are going to uh, do the job. If they do, I think, yeah, that they'll they'll succeed, and maybe we'll will come to accept it. If they don't, I think the the contradictions will be exacerbated. Right, but you think that there's going to be an economic price to pay for all the, I mean, a lot of conservatives do think that. I, I don't know. Oh. I mean, I, I, I'm not an economist. I, I, I'm, I would imagine. Yes, but uh, we'll see. And then coming out of COVID just because we're in, we're having vaccinations and it, it's going to be, I feel like there's going to be a little bit of a boom coming out of that, that might, Everybody expects a big boom with all the money being pumped in, the Trump pumped in, the Biden's pumping in, short term. But you know, what, what, what's after that? The Economist had a had a headline or had a sorry cover uh, with a piggy bank, you know, and Biden's going to break the piggy bank, and it says the big gamble. And on the whole, the, the Economist, pretty centrist, right? A very centrist. Uh, they, they they approved of it. They thought, well, it's worth a shot. Uh, but it's a big gamble. It's a big gamble. And what do you think, percentage-wise, is the tr- Trump running again and then winning again? Uh, come on. I'm not a bookie. What do I know, percentage-wise? Um, I have no well, idea. You're good. And all, my my okay. excuse is it's it's quite a ways off, and a lot can happen in that time. Uh, if it were right now, he'd probably run again, and God forbid he would get the nomination, and then he would lose. But it's a long time to go. Uh, there are people like DeSantis. I mean, who knows? I mean, back four years ago, it looked like uh, Chris Christie might be uh, somebody, and he disgraced himself. Uh, Ron DeSantis looks like he might be somebody who would, would sap a lot of the Trump vote. I don't know. Uh, and um, is there anybody that you like? As a as a candidate right now, besides DeSantis, 
Well, yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I like people who probably haven't got a chance. I, I like Nikki Haley. I like Tim Scott. Um, okay. All right. Ben so, Sass uh, in Nebraska. I mean, these, you know, not very likely. <laughs> yeah, well, um, maybe more attractive after, uh, you know, a few years. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. Anyway, I... Okay. Uh, I appreciate you coming and talking about these things. It's um, it's a tough topic, and uh, I know you you even speak about it at great risk being at a at a college yourself. So it's very good. Well, I hope not great risk, but we'll find out. I mean, I'm very old, and so if things go very bad, I can always quit. But uh, <laughs> so far, so good. Anyway, thank you for asking me. I appreciate it very much. All right, and, and uh, we are talking to. Fred Bauman, he is a professor of political science at Kenyon, and uh, he's, we, we talked about an article you wrote, which is very related to this topic called Liberal Democracy, Liberal Education. Yeah, that was connected with it. I've got something in uh, Ben Kleinerman's Constitutionalist blog, which is about similar issues uh, based on a talk, the Zoom talk I gave to Kenyon alums in the fall. So some of this is recycled. You're right. Once again, thank you so much for coming on, and uh, we'll talk soon. Have a great day, and uh, take care. Thank you very much, Michaela. So long. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody, for listening.